All right. Well, welcome to the second part of the, our seminar. And um, uh, we'll have a talk by Mark Timmons. Um, Timmons and Lynn uh, wrote a paper, Discoveries of Mars or Mass Independent Isotope Effects in the Solar System, a Past, Present, and Future. So, Mark. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, this broadcast is coming to you from Göttingen rather than La Jolla. I took a ran wrong turn coming back from work and I'm here now for Göttingen for the fall. Uh, thanks to Andreas setting this up for me. And um, the slide on the right here, oops, is uh, a picture. This is Harold Urey's old mass spectrometer that I inherited in La Jolla. He brought it with him from Chicago. And so this is the oldest mass spectrometer in the world, a stable isotope ratio mass spectrometer. Uh, he brought it in um, 1956 or 1955. All the measurements you'll hear were made in Urey Hall. Um, you've heard all this um, during the course of this evening. Uh, so I won't go into this part about the theory of mass dependent fractionations and what, cons what are they uh, constituted of and whatnot. You've all, you all know that now. This slide you've already seen also. The only point I'll make of this is that um, it's the general nature of the oxygen isotope effect. It's not just a, a, a one trick pony and there's one way it shows up. These are all the different atmospheric species that contain oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere and all of them are mass independent. We've measured all of these in our lab except for chlorate, which Wei Ming Bao um, wrote a series of papers on, and, and that's shown down in the bottom left hand part of the chapter of the uh, picture. So this, all of these new effects, in way, one way, shape, or form, take course because of either bond formation or dissociation. And so what I'm going to talk about here, which we discuss in the chapter, whoops, it's changing without me changing it, is this slot is um, what happens during these processes. It gives rise to the, the effect. What can we know in more detail that will help us interpret data? <clears throat> the interest in this started um, in measurements from the calcium aluminum inclusion shown on the left here. Uh, that Bob Clayton made, and, the, and these are shown in here, and people, you all know this, they lie along a slope one line. And then our experiments, which were chemically produced in a symmetric molecule like ozone, oops, I don't know why it's advancing by itself. And you can see that you see the, exactly the same slope that occurs during the formation mechanism that you see in the carbonaceous chondrites. The question then we want to dig into in this chapter and in this talk is to tell you what we know, but also what we don't know. So Edwin uh, gave a good talk and a great talk and talked about vibrational frequency. So this is a two dimensional representation of a molecule vibrating in two, two modes. And here you can see the vibrations along this axis in three dimensions. You, this would be the bottom zero point energy and this would be the top but the molecule is like this with the most stable spark part here. For these type of isotope effects, you have to worry about all of these details, both for the formation and the dissociation. So that's what I'll say just a little bit about tonight. So for the solar system, it's easier since a lot of you know it, and it ties up both the dissociation and the association, the back reaction. And it's part of it is photochemistry, which talks about trying to produce isotope effects from just optical shielding. So if you have an a carbon monoxide molecule with oxygen 16 here and oxygen 17 there, oxygen 18 there, the same species, the same cross sections for each state, if it's a low optical opacity, 16, 17, and 18 fractionate mass dependently. If you put in more gas or a longer path length of the beam of light passing through, then you get more of a, I don't know how to stop this, more of an oxygen 17 pure effect, which would look like this. And in between you get the slope one effect, which is the right opacity that 17 and 18 aren't shielded and 16 is so that you get an enrichment in oxygen 17 and it's a slope one because the cross section is what varies and only that. And that goes with the abundance. Now, Clayton exhumed an old model of ours and uh, wrote a comment 
in nature pr proposing that we have a, that the effect goes on in a solar system with the light going out from the sun through the carbon monoxide and then um, being shielded as it goes further out. It doesn't work because the oxygen atom produced back exchanges with the carbon monoxide of the main reservoir. In later mo models, they get away from this by you having a cold region out here, the light coming from the outside in, so that when you make the oxygen, you make water and you trap it and preserve it and not allow it. Other models follow up, but you, you rely on a cold region and make water. So let's look at some of the details that we do in the chapter. So this works if you have no isotope effect in the bond breaking. All of your isotope effect comes from the shielding of the light. People like the model, I know it's simple. You can visualize it as a, a beam of light going through, thinning out and preferentially dissociating out here and most of the isotopes in here, slope one here, make your product, boom, you're done. But it assumes that after the absorption, there's no isotope effect. So let me look at that part of it. So in the actual dissociation, you have a ground state molecule that can go to an excited state, like in carbon monoxide, and it crosses to another excited state, and then it breaks apart. So all of those steps have to be involved in breaking the bond here before it can dissociate after the, the dissociation by the molecule. So you absorb here after the self-shielding and then you lead to the bond straight. In the model, then you're, you're ignoring everything that happens here. So I just, the point I wanna make is that in 70 years, a lot of people have worked on all of the details of how this happens and those are all ignored. And just to make an interesting point, within 30 minutes walk of where I'm sitting here, these are people that all worked on the problem, all are Nobel Prize winners with the exception of Robert Oppenheimer, you probably know, Hund that did the coupling rules and, uh, and um, Otto Hahn who did the, more of the nuclear part. And we've already talked about, I've heard you talk about Maria Mayer, her home is about, is about two blocks from here. So the question is, if you ignore that, what happens? Or let, how do you prove that you can ignore it? In the absorption of the molecule, the actual dissociation, and this is the simple carbon monoxide molecule we spoke of earlier, um, you can only shield at 105 and you can't shield at 107 nanometers. One is a continuum and the other has cross sections associated with different lines and then they dissociate. So one should give you an effect and one shouldn't give you an effect. We've done the experiments and you can see here's a slope, the slopes in the delta 17, 18, here's where the shielding shouldn't occur and here's where the shielding should occur and it gives you the same number. Now, of course, in a, in a theory doesn't, when a theory and a model doesn't matter, match the experiments, the experiments have to be wrong. So, and then the models are always right. So we went back after a lot of people were wringing their hands and worried about it. And well, it might be this, it might be that and criticize it. We've measured the pressure dependency, which, which should change the slope and it doesn't for either one. And we've measured all the other um, parameters associated and published it in five subsequent papers um, that show it can't be a result of the the shielding process, but that's the experiments. So can you do anything more? Well, in the case of carbon monoxide, you don't know the isotopic cross sections well enough for all of the species to do a good job in, in putting together a model to test it. Nitrogen though, you know, you know everything. All the lines have been measured by multiple people. So we use that as an avatar. This is common in chemical physics. If you can't get everything you want from one molecule, you get an avatar that looks like it and you measure that. So we did that. We took nitrogen and went to the best chemical physicists, quantum chemists in the world and got them interested and they started working on it and they showed in a series of papers that the selection process and crossing the states and all that traffic control when you populate the states, which happens after the shielding, are important. 
you can't ignore them. Those Nobel Prize winning people I showed you, they, they actually were right. They turn out they're, they're relatively smart people. A recent paper has gone a step further and shown that to populate all the excited states here in about a femtosecond. So the quantum dynamics are known. Here's the important part. And this is a test of, of, of the model, is can you calculate a shielding model using the nitrogen molecule where you know the cross sections for all the states as a function of wavelength, and they've been determined by three different groups. So don't change anything, only the cross section. Leave the concentrations the same, the path length the same, the same, the light the same, wear the same clothes, the same shoes, and just substitute it. And the only difference is measured cross sections by the best groups in the world. So at room temperature, you can see the results agree within 12,000 per mil. Dry ice temperature, somewhere a little bit more than that. And the best you do in this cross in this range is about three to 4,000 per mil. So there's error bars only by changing the cross section. So let's say, okay, so now we're putting an error bar on the models as compared to putting error bars always on the experiments. Now I put it on the models. This is all the better you can do. So here's the error bars of about a thousand per mil. And here are all the meteorite measurements, plus the water that you make in, in, in the models are here. So this is a, you know, this puts a limit on what you can say. If you look at, if you look at some of the shielding models, here's, here's I think one of the first ones, you can see these beautiful lines showing 50,000 and 100,000 years of evolution, 250,000, it shifts around. You know, it's really nice, but, but look at the range. It's minus 40, it's 100 per mil. And the range between here is about three or four per mil with an error bar from the cross sections and this is carbon monoxide, not nitrogen. You don't know them as well as nitrogen or are very high. So you have to worry about that. There's other models going through the same sorts of things. So there's a good test. Assume that I'm telling you a bunch of nonsense. Just go home, pick a wavelength, pick a cross section, and just, it's a Beers Lambert law calculation basically. Do your own calculation and see how much difference you get only by changing the cross section and assume that gives you a reasonable estimate for the, for the models and, and see what you get. So now you, in the self-shielding part or in anything that you're, you're talking about, you always have to worry about secondary effects. So in the self-shielding or in, in a lot of models, after you make it, after you, sh you shield it, the idea is that you make it into water. And these are measurements these are what people will say is the water measurements are up here and up here of the product of self-shielding. But it actually is a, the magnetite sitting here that's made from water. So it's not the water, but it's, it's the magnetite that they measure inside here. So the question is, does the water actually really simply take the oxygen from self-shielding from CO dissociation and convert it into water without any other process? And the answer is no. Here's a paper from Irina uh, Van Dishhoek, 2013, where they show all the reaction mechanisms. And we and others have measured the fractionation factor with all these steps. So there's intermediate isotope effects that remove part of the oxygen before it gets to water. None of this goes into the models. Second part is, is it safe? Let's forget all of that. Let, let's invoke, Ed Anders always said, you can't invoke more than one miracle. So let's, let's, let's cheat and invoke a second miracle. So here's the solar spectra going from say 60, 70 nanometers up to 400 nanometers. And here's the self-shielding range in the solar spectrum. Here's where the self-shielding occurs at is 105 nanometers. But here's where water absorbs. So water absorbs at the same wavelength as carbon monoxide where the self-shielding occurs, which means you're photo dissociation, photo dissociating the water also. So you have to find a magic spot to protect this and still dissociate that, even though this has a large cross section and assume there's no effect with dissociating the water. So that's another little wrinkle that you have to worry about. 
so let's so thinking so that's the problems with the dissociation part what about when you have to farm things well what are we working with here here's all the meteorite classes the moon mars they're all in three isot if i forget the calcium aluminum inclusions for a second the deviation in the mass independent part is only seven to ten per mil right that's how much you have to worry about to get all the meteorites um, in their bulk compositions. So how do you do that? Well, in the ozone experiments and in the models that follow it, we know that symmetry causes the effect and in the chemical physics community, that's reasonably well agreed on. So ozone has 16 and 18 and 16 and 16 and 16 and 17. That's what I mean by symmetry. Sulfur does the same effect. There's models for S plus S that show it goes. And O plus SiO or OH plus SiO, the first step when you take a gas that you see astrophysically and convert it into a solid product, that should show the effect. Like you see in CAIs, you got to get from your water, if that's what you like, and put it into, the, into a solid to get the slope one line that you see in the CAIs, the ozone experiments. And I think the next one shows us a little better. Let me see if I... Yes, so in these are experiments that we did and published in science that show that in the SiO plus OH, there's two reactions that go on and one we correct for because you know the rate constants, you know the pressures and the amounts. We correct for that reaction and calculate the, solid, the single stage fractionation factor going from a gas to a solid and it's basically a slope one effect. The magnitude of the effect is certainly large enough to accommodate all of the meteorites in the formation process. There's no mixing here. It's the actual chemical physics of the formation process that, that can accommodate all this without having to invoke multiple reservoirs and shielding in the nebula and ignoring all the people down the street here. And so in the process of, of the iron oxidation, so FeO plus OH going and forming ferric oxide or in the experiments with the troilite having water inside of it, you don't need to have anomalous water. It's the step of this oxidation giving you a product that gives you the effect and you don't need the water to be anomalous. You don't have to protect the water. You don't have to hide it in a cold place. You don't have to put it in the closet. It's fine the way that it is. It's the reaction that does it. These, and so you don't have to invoke adding something. You in fact, just need one reservoir to do it not multiple ones. So the other part of this where, where there's things that we need to know shows up here. Here's the solar wind as measured by Genesis by Kevin McKeegan. So this isn't where anyone predicted. This made people, when you know, you, you look at this and you think, well, it's not what we expected. Now I helped, I was one of the co-authors in the original uh, Genesis proposal, and even before that one, it was Sue Suri, and the assumption was is that the sun and the solar wind are identical. So what you collect here is what the sun looks like. And so when they collected it, they said, well, the CAIs is where we want it to be. We predicted them to be here, but it's here. So let's just look. It's a mass fractionation line. If we forget the error bars, which are something like this, then oh, look, it gives us what we want. We only have to apply a, a 45, 50 per mil correction factor, but that's no big deal. It's a 50 per mil correction factor. And, and so is that okay? Can the models that we use, are there models that can give you that? And the answer is, well, if you look at the first ionization potential of the elements that were measured and look at how they compare in what you measure in the solar wind compared to what you predict. The, and forget about the noble gases because they're closed shell. Oxygen doesn't fit. You can't get oxygen to give you the right number compared to what you expect at that ionization potential. No matter which model you use, it doesn't work. So you can't get the elements right in oxygen. And some of the Genesis team and Lamming wrote a paper in 2017. I should have taking the quote directly out that says, you know, that it, 
Right now, our models cannot even get the elemental composition right. So if you make a correction for 100 per mil, when you can't get the oxygen right, there's a limit in this assumption. That's a really big assumption that you're, you're not in good line with. So that correction factor going from here to here is not is based on an extrapolation of a model, but this model that you extrapolate from and the basis behind that doesn't even get the elemental composition right. So, so that's a limit. We have limits in everything. I'm pointing them out. Um, if you look at the data from the calcium aluminum inclusions, these are high temperatures and the, the symmetry dependent effect is a large effect and it's larger at high temperature, it's inverse. So if the premise is that all of the action is up here and this is a back reaction or reaction to form and back reaction uh, to get back to the, to the main solar system composition. And you look at measurements first made by my former office mate, Typhoon Lee, looked at inclusions in Allende that lie on here and later in other inclusions that are interpreted as evaporation of those and back reaction with the main reservoir, which is up here. So everything converges up there. And that points to that as being a reservoir but with only one fractionation process. And so this last figure that I show here shows that here's all the meteorites along near slope one, here's the mass trap fractionation line, and here's most of the atmospheric species which lie basically along a slope one line. So you only need one reservoir. So the, the bottom line, so when it's all said and done, the simplest explanation is in the formation step of the solids. What we need to know more of is how you do the gas to particle formation process. And all, for all these models that I talked about, except for our experiments, there are no other experiments. So we need other people to make do these experiments, which are not trivial. And so the formation and the dissociation experiments, we know a lot of the chemical physics that's being applied now, but there's always room for a lot more in the basic part of that too, as well as new models that include different steps in the process. So in the chapter, all of that is laid out in more details, where the boundaries are in chemical physics, where the boundaries are and how they're applied to geochemistry and cosmochemistry and what's needed. So the last slide is the people that, that helped me do all of this. This is a couple of year old picture. Here's, here's my co-author who's now a professor in Guangzhou, uh, Subhadra Chakraborty who did a lot of the experiments and um, I think Zach, or maybe it was um, Martin, this is Terry Jackson, who worked before me for Hans Seuss, who many of you may know. And so thank you for your attention. I'll stop there and that's it. Thank you, Mark. And do we have questions? We have one question. Hey, um, and uh, I have a question as well when you're done with that one. All righty. Um, first one is, can you explain, please, why some meteorites are above and others below the TFL? What does this mean on a large scale? Ah, oh, you ask a good question, and I had a slide for that, and I dumped it because I didn't want to go over time. If you look, if you look at it in mass balance, the calcium aluminum inclusions sort of draw your eye away because they sit at minus forty per mil, and so that looks like a big effect. But the calcium aluminum inclusions are only in carbonaceous chondrites. And so it's a small species in the miners in the carbonaceous chondrites, whereas most of the meteorites are above the line, but it's a smaller effect. So by mass balance, it, you get some of them that are on the line and, and in a large amount that are above, and then an isotopically a smaller amount, but a bigger isotope below. So the mass balance is sort of there, but you can't do it perfectly just because you don't really know the percent of all the different meteorites. It's a good question. Like All right, we have a couple more. Um, does the Marcus 2001 silicon dioxide condensation mechanism predict the sign and magnitude of D170 in your experiments? No, you can't because you can't even do it for ozone. What you have to, that's the biggest criticism of, of Rudy Marcus theory is that um, you can't get the magnitude of the fractionation effect in ozone, which is what he starts by measuring. So he assumes what he calls an eta function and the calculation of it. 
And in the calculation of that, um, he has to, he uses the ozone measured values to do it, which is, which is, uh, which is reasonable, it's what you have. That's why in my so-called biased presentation, I used the measurements and not the theory and not the models. And I didn't put assumptions in it. I just showed you measurements. There's one last question, Ilya, do we have time? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, last one is, why is the symmetry dependent effect larger at high temperatures? It, yeah, that's a good question. It, it's, 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 part of it is in the review paper and the one that we did before that. But it comes about because of the, when you're crossing between one state and another, you have what they call, they have channels. And in the channels, you have effects um, that become, the line widths become larger in, in, in a sense. And so you have a greater pathway to selectivity. And so the sorting out becomes larger at higher temperature because of that effect. But it comes in in the state crossings. And, and that's a little harder to, to say without showing you the mathematics of it. Those were the only questions. Okay.